exchange traded funds for agricultural commodities. That's what we're talking about investments, money, and ag commodities in this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, and the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. Got a great one for you today. We're talking to Jake Hanley. He's with a company called Tucrium. Uh, and they they communicate with me and I said, you know, this is an interesting topic. We talk a lot about money and business in, in, this, uh, in this show here. And exchange traded funds for agricultural commodities. And I believe they're... The angle here is making agricultural commodities uh, investing and trading less complex, which certainly it needs to be. Uh, full confession, Jake, and I've told my audience this before, I have a degree in agricultural economics, yet I have absolutely zero interest in being a trader of commodities. I, I've i pointed out that if I had to be the guy on uh, rural radio for five hours a day doing the market report and pretend I was excited about a two-cent move in the soybean complex, I'd take the nine millimeter out of my, out of my desk drawer here and, and end it. So... <laughs> Um, I find it to be tediously boring, frankly, um, and also I'm not an expert at it. Um, you know, it's like I think I got a C in that in that class at Purdue, and it's just uh, it's never been my thing. But then I hear about your company, and you're making it so that it's an ETF. And somebody that doesn't know what an ETF is, you can start there. So tell us a little bit about what what this is and what it proposes to do. And you can start by explaining to our audience what an ETF is, if maybe they're uh, they're uh, a little bit unfamiliar. Yeah, well, my goal for here, we'll set the bar low, is that nobody wants to kill themselves listening to this conversation. So uh, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for that introduction, but it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, ETF is an acronym. Everything's an acronym. ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. And the idea here, most folks are familiar with mutual funds. The difference is, big difference, there are a few differences, but the big one is when you invest in a mutual fund, you're making a one-time daily decision. You can buy and that trade goes in at the end of the day, or you sell and that trade goes in at the end of the day. With exchange traded funds, they trade on an exchange, New York Stock Exchange, for example, and you as the investor have the opportunity to trade intraday. So uh, when you're putting in an investment, just like you would for an individual stock, um, you can set limit orders and things of that nature, but the trick is that you can trade it during the day. And so that's an exchange traded fund. So most people obviously familiar with you know their 401k or in their individual IRA, whatever, they probably have some mutual funds, and a mutual fund is just a collection of money that invests in stocks. And the idea when this started becoming a thing was sort of just to then an index, which exchange trade fund doesn't mean the same thing as an index, but many are. Am I right about that? And then I guess I want to then take it from stock investing to commodities, which is what you do. Uh, um, am I right that a lot of ETFs are also indexes, meaning they just mimic the marketplace? Yeah, and there's a, the idea of a passive investment versus an active strategy. Uh, and so probably the most famous uh, exchange-traded fund is SPY, SPY, and that tracks the S&P 500 uh, index. Uh, passive, meaning that your performance is going to be whatever the index performance is, net of fees and expenses. Um, whereas there are actively traded uh, exchange-traded funds where you actually have a manager sitting there uh, trying to pick the tops and bottoms of, of stocks or bonds or whatever the investment might be. Um, and so there are active strategies in ETFs, but yeah, you're correct to say that most most are passive. So Jake, you've got this company, Tucrium, <laughs> and, um, and you do this for ag commodities. And so 
you know, if you grew up in agriculture, every day at noon, we came in and ate lunch and listened to the whoa, whoa, and obviously had to have the ag report and then the commodities report. And now everybody has this on their phone and they're tracking this sort of thing. So what I'm assuming <laughs> is the person that's not an active commodity trader, and many farmers aren't, uh, and, and some will get way over their head, over their skis anyhow when they do it. This is is this for non farm people? Is this uh, so that the people that are my suburban neighbors at my winter home in Arizona can be invested in corn without actually having a, a grain bin full of corn? Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely one use case for it. Uh, you know, the the genesis of these funds goes back to uh, about the mid to late two thousands, the aughts, and we saw that the investment world was craving exposure to commodities but in a format that lowered the barrier of entry. And so, you know, our funds invest in futures contracts. And so anybody that, you know, has the the money to do so or, or the acumen to do so can open a futures trading account and can certainly go long or short beans or corn, whatever they wanted to do. Uh, most farmers, you know, work with, uh, you know, professional brokers to do this sort of thing and professional yeah. risk managers. Um, However, some don't want to open futures accounts. And so not only for the farmers, and there's certainly a bunch of farmers that, that invest in our ETFs, uh, but also for, for the speculators or for you know that, that nephew that says, hey, my uncle's talking about corn prices going up. He runs you know, a couple thousand acres. I want exposure to corn. How do I do that? Um, well, the idea was there's an ETF for that now. Okay. And so we're trying to make it easier for the general public to invest in, in these commodity futures. <laughs> Did you pioneer this? Did Tucrium invent this? Tucrium did not invent the structure. Um, there were energy commodity ETFs that were out first, yep. uh, but Sal Gilberti, our founder, was uh, pioneered corn, wheat, soybeans, uh, and and sugar as the single commodity uh, ETFs in the way that they're packaged. Got it. So I want you to tell me how it works because um, I think that anybody is listening is like, okay, you know. <clears throat> I want to be in on this. First off, I'm always wondering why would why would a person want to be in there? But okay, explain how it works, and then also explain why a person wants to be in on this. Yeah, sure. So starting with with how it works, um, you have a sophisticated audience here. Folks understand the futures markets, and now you have different contract dates uh, and expiry dates and delivery dates. And one of the challenges, and this was the initial opportunity that Sal saw, the challenge with packaging these commodity ETFs is. Use oil, for example. Okay, there's there's 12 contracts in a year. Uh, the challenge is maintaining that exposure to oil markets over the course of the year. And the first generation of funds solve for this by owning 100% in the front month contract. Well, in a market like oil, that means you're rolling out because you need to per maintain perpetual exposure. You're rolling 12 times a year, 100% of the portfolio. Now, if you're in a carry market like agriculture typically is, okay, that means you have a negative yield, right? You're always rolling out to buy the deferred contract, and that negative yield, that carry market, can eat into um, into your portfolio, uh, you know, value over time. And so, what Sal did was he said, "Look, we're going to own across the curve. We're not going to own." Front months. Number one, it's it's volatile, and once you get into delivery and these things, it complicates the pricing of the front month contract. So we're going to own the second to expire contract, the third to expire contract, and then an anchor contract. And that anchor contract for corn, wheat is the December contract. For soybeans, it's November. And that third anchor contract is the, we'll just use corn for example, the December following the third to expire. Okay, that's a mouthful. You can find the information on the website. The idea, however, is that now in corn, instead of rolling 100% of the portfolio five times a year, you're rolling roughly a third of the portfolio five times a year, trying to mitigate that negative impact of the carry market, right? Where the the lower, uh, the front month contracts are, are priced lower than the back month contracts. Now, by lowering uh, that that negative impact of, of the carry market, it allows an investor to maintain exposure over a period of time. So a year, year and a half, two years, whatever it is, that allows people to take a strategic position in corn prices or soybean prices over a longer term um, cycle, again, mitigating the negative impact of the carry market. Okay. By the way, 
I want to hear then, uh, obviously, then what your results are. Uh, you're yeah. sitting in a nice office, so somebody must somebody must be making money off of this. It could just be you, but I'm guessing not. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't probably still be there. Um, I want to talk to you, dear listeners, about uh, True Terror real quickly. I'm wearing her hat if you happen to be watching this, and I hope you are watching it because, you know, Jake's a good-looking guy. Uh, remember, you can go to my YouTube channel. Please hit subscribe when you go there. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. I put stuff on it every week. It's the Damien Mace channel on YouTube. You can also check it out on Acres TV. Uh, if you're a listener and you'd like to be a viewer. <clears throat> Truterra is focused on supporting farmers at every stage of their sustainability journey to help plan, make, and maintain regenerative management practices. So you know what? Maybe you want to make a little bit extra money. They can help you get a contract to make money for stuff you might already be doing. Some reduced tillage, nitrogen uh, reduction, uh, strip till, uh, cover crops. <clears throat> Those kinds of things can make you money from Truterra. You know what? You're like this. You could probably stand to make a little bit more money. So go to TruterraAg.com to see if maybe you could sign up your acres and make a little bit of additional revenue. Revenue, who doesn't like more money? Okay, trueterrag.com. Jake, um, I give you $10,000, whatever. Is there a minimum? $20,000, $100,000. What do I need to give you? Is there a minimum? No minimum other than if your broker has a minimum. So Fidelity or Schwab, no minimum. Do I invest directly with you or do I have to go through somebody like a Fidelity or Schwab? You have to go through a broker like Fidelity or Schwab. Okay. So then I go through them and I say, hey, I, I've heard about this guy on the business of agriculture. His name's Jake. His company's called Tucrim. And um, so I want to invest with them. So we're not doing a thing where I'm buying corn to this morning and I'm thinking it's going to be worth more by tomorrow and then I'm going to sell it out tomorrow. That's not what's happening here. You could do that. Okay. But, you know, word of caution, if you're doing that because you see the the quote on CNBC or you're looking at front month corn futures, yeah. the corn ETF, you know, is not going to track front month corn futures because it's diversified across the curve, like I said. Uh, but we certainly do have short term traders that are in for a day or two. We, we see that in the flows. Okay. So <clears throat> I, I don't have a minimum, but unless my brokerage has a minimum, I give you this money. And it seems to me that to make money on this, to get a return, I need to be in this for the long haul. That's kind of what I think I heard you say. Yeah. And that's how the, the product is structured yeah. to allow you to stay in there for, for a period of time. Who are your investors? The majority of the investors we have are self-directed, meaning they are the folks you know that are trading their own, uh, their own accounts. Um, we do have financial advisors who recommend our funds. Uh, and we we maintain good relationships with those folks because they they get it. Typically, those financial advisors, by the way, are in the uh, corn belt of the world, right. um, in Iowa and so forth. And so, uh, but most of the investors we have are the self-direct type that understand mm -hmm. the cyclical nature of these commodity prices. And uh, we talk about a, a longer term strategy called the golden grain cycle. Right. And it's golden because once you understand it, you can see that there are ways to profit from an allocation to something like corn, wheat, or soybeans. Um, and we can get into that a little bit if you'd like. But sure. the, the basic part of the golden grain cycle is the idea that prices tend to trade at or near their cost of production, as your audience knows, for an extended period of time. Right. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with what we'll be talking about at the end of this week here. Is is acreage? You know, acreage you know, continues to grow in South America, of course, but in the United States, we're you know roughly at that 180 million combined acreage, and we plant that pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, the the insurance that we have, the subsidies that we have backing that insurance, put farmers in the field to plant. And so, prices trade roughly sideways for an extended period of time near that cost of production until something bad happens. And that something bad could be a drought, that something bad could be a war. Typically, it's a drought. Um, and then we have a, a production issue where our stocks use ratio, right? The ending stocks relative to, to our usage gets tight and prices spike. And we've seen those prices spike in, in corn uh, you know, three times in the last 15 years, where you've gone from a baseline of about $3.50 on the national futures equivalent, okay, we'd call that roughly break even, $3.50 to double over $7. Yeah. And again, that's happened three times over the last 15 years. And so that's part of the golden grain cycle. It's a three-stage cycle we talk about. But once you see that, you can understand having a longer term strategic allocation to, to agriculture. So you people that are in, invested are ag people. There, there's not, it's, you know, it's not, it's not the suburban, uh, it's not the suburban doctor and uh, uh, from Schaumburg. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's the dentist that um, you know got a hot tip from from his uncle or something. It, it, no, that happens, okay, and uh, it happens especially when commodities are in the headlines. Now, in twenty twenty two, by the way, Jake, just like agricultural yeah. real estate, uh, the last time we had the big run about two thousand twelve, when I was in uh, with a bunch of mixed company uh, people uh, here in Arizona, where I live in the winter time, and I had somebody from Scottsdale, Arizona, that's, uh, that doesn't know a soybean from a Holstein. And say, hey, now should we be buying farmland? Because I heard it's realized that, uh, and I started telling everybody, sell, sell. When, when <laughs> and now's the time. When when the person in Scottsdale, Arizona, that doesn't know soybean from a Holstein is talking about buying farmland, it's probably at a peak. So it's kind of the same thing here. So you have the dentist that gets a hot tip because he's working on the teeth of somebody in agriculture and says, holy crap. Corn's worth a whole bunch of money. Then that's that's uh, what usually happens. Does that money come in or not really? Yeah, no, that money comes in. And, you know, we saw it come in in a big way in our wheat fund in 2022 when Russia invaded Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was it was very simple for the, the news media to jump on the fact that 30% of global exports for wheat came from the Black Sea region. And uh, boy, that was all it took. Um, you know, those big headline stories are easier to understand and digest than, you know, when we talk about the the Dece corn to November soybean ratio and what that means for prospective plantings and so forth. Uh, so naturally, the the agriculture, the Corn Belt, they understand, they get it, they see the ticker CORN and they know what that means. Um, but it takes a big headline story like a war between Russia and Ukraine yep. uh, that's easy to digest and, and people will try to treat that. So um, I, I assume this is, uh, first off, the people that invest with you that would do this are people that are generally from ag, except for, as you say, when the when the dentist, uh, when the plastic surgeon gets a, gets a hot tip and then uh, runs into it. So it's going to be ag. Is it just pure return or is it diversification? Because I, I need to know what kind of returns we're talking about. I'm just going to speculate that there's probably other asset classes that return better, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, you know, we were having this conversation this morning. If stocks keep going up forever, who's ever going to allocate to commodities again? Right. Um, you know, it's it's twofold. One, it depends on your investor profile. If you're the type of investor that does like to trade and you don't want to, you know, shoot yourself with a nine millimeter, mm. uh, you know, these funds again, they don't track spot, but they do track the price of corn, wheat, soybeans, and so there is a way that you can tactically manage in and out of these. Uh, these funds as the markets move. And so you can certainly do that. There is a diversification component. You know, when you look at the price of corn, wheat, soybeans, you know, typically they're not correlated to the stock market or even to the bond market. And so if you're a financial advisor or you're just looking at your investment portfolio overall, you're looking for something that zigs when other markets zag, agriculture can fit that for you. Um, importantly, you know, we've launched a a strategy that can go both long and short agriculture markets. Okay. So now there is a, uh, Two Cream's newest iteration is a, a product that uh, can profit regardless of which way the, the market moves because it can take short positions as well. That type of strategy is absolutely for the allocator, the person that doesn't necessarily know if it's a good time to be in, in corn or wheat, uh, but they know that they want that exposure. Um, you know, something like that makes sense for a long-term buy and hold type of person, we think. Okay. So that that's uh yeah, I, I think the the diversification and then yes, that agriculture tends to be run counter cyclical to Main Street economy. So there's that component of it. What kind of returns if I had if I gave you a hundred thousand dollars two years ago, uh what's reasonable that I would have now? Well, if you you know, put that in the corn ETF, ticker C O R N, right? Um, you can simply chart that by looking at where corn prices have been over the last two years. You know, net of net of fees and expenses. Again, our structure being that it's long only. Yep. If corn prices are going up. Your investment is going to go up. If corn prices are going down. Your investment is going to go down. Um, and we're we're honest about this. We have our our newsletter that we put out roughly you know twice a month where we're staying on top of the the markets. You know, doing that that afternoon commodity hour talk, saying hey, where price is going, what do we think is happening here? And uh, you know, look, everybody knows in the last eighteen months prices have been trending lower. And so was was that a good time to be exposed to long only uh, commodities ETFs? Not necessarily. However, if you're holding these commodity ETFs because they give you the diversification benefits, mm -hmm. right? so in case stocks fall out of bed, I got something that that might not fall out of bed. Uh, 
you know that 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 certainly makes sense as well. So if you're looking for historical returns, you know you can pull up our website. I'm sorry I don't have the fact sheets in front of me right now, but we post all the performance. Um, typically, it just follows the price of of these commodities. So the <clears throat> the 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 angle, I guess, not angle. That sounds almost shady. Um, the the approach, the pitch, the it, to to you know the kitchen the kitchen table economics you know I'm sitting here I've got I've got a certain amount of money and then some of it's in farm ground some of it's in my retirement account whatever whatever you could say Damon you should put some into this and we're going to make it more simplified I think that that's I think the angle is simplification it is simplification and you know to give you the the, the simple story here when you you think about uh, an investment portfolio overall very simple you typically have stocks and bonds. Uh, in the investment industry, people say it's a 60-40 split. 60% goes in stocks, 40% goes in bonds, right? And we simply say, what about alternative asset classes? Alternative asset classes include real estate, they include commodities. And when we look at your commodity portion of that portfolio, usually we'll see that folks are overweight in energy and precious metals. People think about oil prices all day, every day. They stop <laughs> at the gas pump, right? Uh, precious metals. Everybody loves you know to talk about gold, 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 gold. Right, right, right. But what about agriculture, yeah. right? And that's where we say there's there's another asset you know inside this commodity sleeve yeah. that's underloved by a lot of investors. And by the way, it has a lot of diversification components to it. And as we see, 2012, 2013, right, 2020 to 2022 times of significant price expansion that can help your portfolio. You know, our tags um, ETF, that index now, it's a combination. It's corn, wheat, soybeans, and sugar. Okay. And, and cane sugar is another component. Uh, that portfolio is weighted 25% to each of those strategies. Okay. So equally weighted corn, wheat, soybeans, and sugar. Six out of the last six stock market corrections of 10% or more. This tags index has outperformed the stock market. All right. So when we say there's diversification components, that's what we're talking about. Yep. When stocks fall out of bed and there's something in your portfolio that's working, yep. one, it might help you sleep better at night. But uh, if you're managing money for another person, this is why financial advisors you know, really grab onto the story. They can point to something in their portfolio that's doing well, even when everybody else is complaining that their their stock portfolio is falling, falling out of bed. So um, that type of diversification is, is really important. Yeah, well, you know, uh, it was made simple. It was simplified to me a long time ago when I, I was talking to my investment guy about something, and and we talked about, well, you know, where, where you gonna put, where would you put your money? You know, there's only five classes. Uh, there's you know, cash, whether it's CD, checking account, savings account, uh, you know, uh, stocks, bonds, uh, commodities, yep. real estate. I guess if you think crypto is actually real, you could you could call it an asset class. Well, I guess maybe you could throw collectibles. Hell, I don't know art, sure. um, vintage cars. I guess so. There's there's another asset class, if you will. But that's pretty much it. And most people, even within agriculture, don't have any allocation into commodities. Am I right? Oh yeah, for for sure. And you know, a word a word of caution out there too. So if if you're out there riding the combine and you you own your property and you're planting corn, and you're planting soybeans, you're doing all this, and then you go buy the corn ETF, you know, think about your diversification from a holistic standpoint here. Okay, uh, it's like a guy in Wall Street owning nothing but a portfolio of bank stocks. Your, yeah. your entire livelihood is tied yeah. up into this stuff. So yeah, your your, uh, your point is your point is if you're all in on agriculture, you're already all in on corn because you grow the stuff, and right. you're 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 real estate is your ability to pay for your real estate in Iowa based on your ability to grow corn. Maybe you shouldn't also have all of your free money then invested in a corn ETF. Is that what I'm hearing? That That's absolutely correct. Now, again, we have a, a strategy that can go short. So if you wanted to put all your money in that, you could consider you know that option, a strategy that can go short the market as a diversification. Uh, that's a shameless plug, of course, Damien. And I promise him. And and I and I liked it. And I'm going to also tell you, I, I, we're going to have to then get into the whole thing about where where stuff's going. So that way, I know we said before we hit record, we were going to do a lot of predictive because uh, everybody and their sister wants to do that. Right. I have made the crack that uh, you know, and I know a bunch of these guys. Matt Bennett and I are buddies. He's on the and then Vaklovic has been on this episode on this show. He's a commodities guy, but they generally don't do the uh, the usual. But at every speaking engagement, 
Well, here's what's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be some pl- some uh, some acres being bought here in the March and April trade, and then when, when the, and then there's a planning report that comes out. I could give their talk in my sleep, and I don't even do this because it's usually the same shit. Uh, then, then around June, there's going to be some uh, some talk about what's happening in South America. A little bit of global pressure is going to move the markets by oh, quite a bit, like ten cents. Like oh, whoopty, whoopty, crap, ten cents. And then around August, there's going to be some weather scare. It's going to get real hot and dry, so we're going to see some movement there. And at the end, we're still going to harvest ninety million acres of corn and ninety million acres of soybeans. We're going to probably be about fifty-one bushels of beans and one hundred and seventy-seven bushels of corn. And you know what? Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. It's the same report. Every year. Actually, yeah. what I'm always struck by, Jake, is how did corn go from $3.80 to $7 when it's the same report every year? Before you answer <laughs> that question for me, I got a little bit off on a, on a tirade there. That was just, good. That's why my audience tunes in. Just, yeah, just sound like they go to NASCAR to see the wrecks. They tune into Damian Mason to know when eventually I'm going to fly the hell off the handle and start crazy talk. I want to tell you guys about my new sponsor, Redox. Redox Bionutrients, a family-owned business with products for agriculture and turf. They started in specialty crop, moved into turf, and now are going more and more into broad acre agriculture. You need to know about them because unlike a bunch of these biospace companies that have investor money and tech money from Silicon Valley and Bill Gates, this is not one of them. This is a 30-year-old company. Obviously, you don't stick around for 30 years if your stuff sucks. Their stuff doesn't suck. I've been to their headquarters in Burley, Idaho. Great people. Proven products. Good R and D. You can go to redoxgrows.com and check out their stuff. Redox Grows, R E D O X, redoxgrows.com. 30 year company, proven in field success, providing superior nutrition, abiotic stress defense, root growth, soil health, and efficient nutrient uptake. That is what their products do. Go check it out, redoxgrows.com. Um, are we at a low? I mean, all my joking about predicting the markets, it seems like. I think we stay here. I I can't imagine production's going to de- drop. Um, yeah, is there going to be global turmoil? Well, China's probably going to uh, invade Taiwan uh, based on the senile puppet not uh, not pre- presenting any level of strength uh, uh, in the United States of America. Um, there could be some global turmoil, but I don't think that changes the prices. Am I wrong? Depends on the extent of the global turmoil. Um, and and how it changes prices, you know, locally. Um, when we talk about the golden grain cycle and prices moving sideways for an extended period of time, we call that stage one. And I th- we put out in our 2024 outlook that we believe that this year we will enter stage one. By the way, that's coming off of stage three. It's a three stage cycle where prices go down. Yeah. Okay, and prices have certainly been coming down. And so at these levels, uh, there might be another five or ten percent. Uh, leg lower before we're at the uh, you know that that floor, if you will. I use the term floor, you know, kind of softly here because you can always dip below for a little bit, right? But when we drew the line at three dollars and fifty cents between twenty sixteen and twenty twenty, as being roughly the national futures equivalent cost of production, okay? Yep. Uh, I think we're we're pretty close to that. And if you see that between four and four fifty, that's that's where I think we are. Sal Gilberti thinks it might be three seventy five to four and a quarter. You know, he's our CEO. He has more experience than I do. Maybe that's what it is. But uh, Damien, I think I think we're we're okay to say that we are entering that stage one where we're going to be moving sideways, unless there's a significant disruption. And in, in what you're talking about is geopolitics. And look, all that has to do is impact local markets. You know, so what happens to your local basis um, in in a big you know, bad event as a war. Uh, we saw, for example, that prices went pretty crazy, right? The Chicago wheat contract shot up, you know, significantly when Russia invaded Ukraine. But boy, what happened to Polish wheat prices, right? They got clamored, right? Because all that Ukrainian grain started moving west and it really pushed prices down. And so uh, I think what you can say is that geopolitical events can cause uh, significant disruptions. Doesn't necessarily mean prices go up. All right, and that's that's really important as well. Um, there, if there's a drought, you know, somebody that you know, I read is uh, Sean Hackett. He's got this whole weather model. I'm not sure if you've had Sean on the show here before. I just saw Sean Hackett uh, last week. Okay, so yep. so you know Sean, right? We got this Gleisberg cycle, 89 years, and boy, oh boy, 2025 could be this significant period of heat and drought. And uh, what's that do to river transport? All right. So, yeah, on one hand, you could have crops really take a hit. But on the other hand, we can't get it out because we can't ship down to Mississippi. Well, what's the net effect on prices? So 
again, it's it's not necessarily the price is going up, but I still think we're we're in for bouts of volatility just given weather and and geopolitics. <clears throat> is the um, is the job of you and to Graham to um, to get more people invested in it because this seems like. Uh, We've democratized uh, commodities investing because we're, we're making it. This is, this is something that uh, formerly only, uh, I mean, mutual funds did that, right? In the 1970s, only rich people uh, owned stocks. Now, half, you know, what, 60% of Americans own stocks in some form or another, usually through mutual funds. Is, is this where you guys are? Yeah, I think that's that's a fair thing to say. You know, our mission is to simplify access to alternative markets. Right, and, and we're we're in agriculture. That's our bread and butter. So, um, simplify access to to agricultural commodities. Mostly, Jake, you've referenced sorts. oil. Do, yep. Is your stuff only? Uh, I mean, there's no gold or oil or uh, coal or natural gas uh, in 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 Tucrium. It's only stuff that grows in the field generally. Yeah, since 2010 uh, through last year, we had corn, wheat, soybean, sugar standalone. So if you want exposure to the specific crops, you yep. could buy those ETFs. We yep. also had uh, tags, which again is a quarter into each, 25% each corn, wheat, soybeans, and sugar. Uh, but we did last year launch a base metals ETF. Uh, so you know, base metals being things like nickel, copper, aluminum, um, also a long short strategy. Uh, just like our our uh, agricultural long short strategy, uh, and there are some reasons that we went into into the base metals market, but primarily uh, we licensed an index, okay, and that index had historical returns that were very attractive in a place that's very interesting. And I think you know base metals are an important component to to the future. Um, and not a lot of people really understand the role base metals plays. Not a lot of people really understand the role agriculture plays. Okay. Uh, but similarly, it's the the same index group. They're called ILA Investments. They have a quantitative strategy that they packaged into an index using machine learning technology. The historical returns for these indexes is is really good. You know, double digit returns since 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's an agriculture product and a base metals product. Uh, but we're we're mostly focused in agriculture. Jake, if I'm an investor. Um, and again, I, I've not, I've, I don't invest in commodities. And I, like I told you, I, I think I, it was Dr. Joe Yule's class and I called it Aggie Con 320. And I, I got a C in it and I thought, good God, I hate this. But anyway, <laughs> grain, grain marketing. Um, if I have, you know, if the markets go down, I have to then put more money in if I'm a commodities investor. Am, am I right about that? And then does that happen with you? So if I gave you 100 grand and corn goes to 350 from four, where are we right now? 430 roughly today. We're recording yeah, sure. this here. Yep. In the March. Um, do I have to? Do I have to? I have to write you another check? You do not. You do not. So we, when you're managing your own futures position. You get something that's called a margin call or a collateral call there where you, you go. got to post extra collateral. Um, we manage all that on on our side. Uh, and so, you know, uh, to go back to your example, if you had $10,000 and you wanted to invest in the corn ETF. I think I said 100. I wanted to sound 100,000. So I think oh, I okay. said 100. Well, whatever the numbers. I, I just scraped 90,000 off. So thank you for that. So let's use let's use 100. So you put $100,000 into the corn ETF. Thank you very much. Um, and we only have to pledge you know, this is just broad sketch numbers, okay? This isn't the exact numbers. But we put 5% down with the CME, let's say, okay? Yep. With 5% down, we get 100% exposure. We get $100,000 worth of exposure to the futures. Now, your $95,000 is in collateral, you know, accounts, uh, mostly, you know, cash equivalents. So, uh, you know, short-term treasuries and, and that sort of thing. And we will use that extra collateral as needed to pledge with the CME if prices are coming down. Um, so to answer your question directly, it's not something you have to be concerned about uh, as the investor in the ETF. We manage that, manage that for you. As we manage the rules, you know, so as as the contract's coming off um, the board, again, remember our benchmark is second, third, and then the anchor month. Um, we're we're rolling, rolling those positions and it's not anything that you necessarily need to think about. We post all the information on the website so you can see the calendar if you're interested. Um, but yeah, no, you don't have to worry about that. So you take a, your company takes a, a rake, obviously, for doing this. It's a bit, you know, a mutual fund management fee or whatever. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, 
We work in an industry, I'm just going to tell you something, that people are very cheap. Agricultural people have been conditioned to be very cheap. Do you get gripes about that from your agricultural investors or are they are, are they a, a gradation above the cheap level where it's like, I get it, somebody <laughs> somebody, has, somebody has to make money to do all this work? I'm just wondering because, you know, yeah. I, I can see it. Trust me, agriculture people, we're bred to be cheap. Is yeah, that an issue? It's good. Thrifty, efficient. You know, we can we can use uh things. Yeah. So absolutely not. Um our our fee is is one percent. Uh, yeah. and it's and it's there and you see it. Um and then you you can just note that that one that percent of of your assets is the annual expense. One uh, percent annually. So if I give you hundred grand, uh a grand uh, I'll give you hundred, you take one to do the management and the Supervision. What else did we not cover? What I what else do I need to know about this whole space? Not about two cream in particular, just about this whole yeah. space. Is it growing? Are more people coming piling into it? There seems to be there's a whole hell of a lot of money out there. Boy, you're not kidding. So we had uh in 2022 again, you know, t- remember that was a bad year for the stock market. Stocks were down uh boy, 18% or something. Yeah, 20% like that, roughly, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. And so commodities overall outperformed that. So we we look at a general commodities index uh that's published by Bloomberg, so they call it the BCOM, the Bloomberg Commodities Index. That index was up 13% that year. By the way, that was a year where bonds were down as well. So you had stocks and bonds down, commodities did well, yep. right? A lot of people started their exposed, gaining exposure to agriculture at that point. Income the plastic down. surgeons, income the plastic, income, income the, <laughs> right? And then what happened in 23? In 2023, commodity prices went down. Uh-huh. Right. In 2024, so far it's been a little rocky. We, uh-huh. we saw gold come back up, and, and energy's doing okay, right? But agriculture keeps keeps going lower. And so, um, you know, as people have gotten burned coming in here in, in 2022, uh, you know, we've come back to the table with with the story of, hey, look, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense to be long commodities all the time. There is a case to be made for a strategy that can uh, potentially profit, regardless of which way commodity prices are going. Yep. Uh, because, boy, in 2022, if you had exposure to commodities, stocks and bonds are, are both down, commodities are up, you were really happy. Okay. And so, uh, however, 2023, 2024, that's not the case so far. So what, what is an investor to do uh, in taking those long-term strategic allocations? We think there's a way that you can craft your portfolio to get alpha, i.e. outperformance, and beta, which is the diversification component. Okay, we we talked a lot about that. You can find us on the website and so forth. Yep, uh, that goes that goes through all that sort of stuff. So, so back to the other thing, uh, it does seem that there's a a raft of money sitting around um, looking for something to you know. That's what we could argue has kept the real estate prices where they are, even with the inflate uh, with the um, interest rates. Um, there's it, there's, and I'm not and I'm not anyway being. Uh, mean or disrespectful to people at the lower end of the economic spectrum. I'm just saying from for the people that are in say the top half, they've got there's some money to be invested. And it seems to me that it's looking for a return. So are you seeing more, you know, is it still there? I mean, is it still people hey, tell me about this way to put into commodities. Is that is that a real thing? Uh that is that is a real thing, just not at this point. At this point it's put it into NVIDIA or put it into to Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, but you're on something here, David, because what uh, some folks haven't connected the dots all the way, but this is precisely what happened. We had a huge COVID stimulus, all right? We had to save the world by pumping money in the system. That money, people got direct deposits to their to their bank accounts, right into their checking account. Yep. They spent that money at the time the world was shut down, so we didn't have production. So you had a lot of money chasing goods that weren't being produced. Right. Right. Too much money chasing too few goods. Inflation. Okay. However, that money did get spent, and it got spent, and it created corporate profits. That means bonuses get paid out. That means the upper earners, okay, yep. mid-level management, higher, et cetera, okay, folks who are doing well in the economy, they're not, uh, they invest and save a higher proportion of their income. Yep. So now what we have is too much money chasing too few shares outstanding. Yep. You look at the stock market, there's only a few numbers of shares outstanding of NVIDIA. Everybody wants to get in on NVIDIA, what happens? The stock price goes up. Yep. Okay. And so that's that's continuing to happen. Call it a bubble or not, fine. When stocks go down, that's when the interest comes into commodities. Yep. And our position is look, have that allocation set, 
consider that exposure, not necessarily when everybody's trying to claim her and get in. You were already in. Right. You didn't, didn't have to be smart. You were already there. there uh, um, yep, yep, yep. That's it. The time, the time to, it's, it's, it's time to walk when everybody's running. It's time to run when everybody's walking. And I think that's what we just heard right there. And yes, that's an yeah, um, interesting thing. You could argue that uh, what, I, I appreciate um, um, simplifying things because people sometimes say, you know, I'm not, you're great at economics. I'm not so good. I'm like, no, you know, really, let's just talk about what this really is. And obviously you just, basically you just paid the picture that it too, too much money t- chasing a reduced amount of goods creates inflation. Well, it also inflates investments. And you can argue that there's plenty of money sloshing around that's been chasing something that would hopefully give a return. And therefore, a lot of investments are overvalued. In particular, you and I both think stocks and real estate look a little frothy. They have for a while. Yeah, I I agree. But in, by the way, that doesn't change the fact that the price is what the price is. And so, you know, it, 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 don't begrudge it. You know, what's that old saying? Um, don't hate the the player, hate the game. Well, look, you know, when the music's playing, yeah. okay, you got to dance. And That's so it. The, the music's playing. And so, you know, for folks out there, don't just be upset that the prices are running away. Um, you know, participate, be smart. And uh, you know, manage your risk, and that's that's the name of the game. And part of that involves diversification, which is why I had you on here. The democratization of commodity investing—that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, that's what you're 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 making it. You're making it to you know, chicken in every pot, car in every garage, and uh, now uh, now because of Tucrium exchange traded funds for ag commodities and in every investment portfolio. Look at that. That's beautiful. We're going to hire you. We need to, yeah, I'm going to write that down. Thank yeah, you. all right. All right. All right. I'll, I'll do that again. A chicken, every pot, a car, in every garage, and an exchange trade fund for ag commodities in every investment portfolio in America. All right. His name is Jake Hanley. Yeah. If you want to learn more about this company, like I said, then they don't even give me anything for promotion, but I just thought it was an interesting topic for for uh, for you guys. If they want to find out more, it's a funny way to spell it. T-E-U-C-R-I-U-M, two, cre, um. I assume that we can go to two cream.com? Two cream.com. You got it, sir. Thank you. So next time, be sure to check out my friends over at Truterra and Redox. Redox grows, TruterraAg.com, those websites. Until next time, thanks for being here. His name is Jake Hanley. My name is Damian Mason, and this is The Business of Agriculture. Well, that concludes another fantastic episode of The Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics, not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil. 